This is the CC Radio Podcast. Welcome to the show, everyone. You are listening to Believe, Australian Paranormal and UFO Radio. My name is Cade Moyer, and thanks for tuning in. If you've had an encounter, get in touch with me. My email address is believe at ccradio.com.au or you can message me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash believe UFO Radio. If you enjoy this episode, there are a few things you can do to help the show. Firstly, you can go to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and review. Or you can share the show around social media with your friends and family, and that would help us grow. Just before we jump into the show, guys, I just want to thank you all for listening. The feedback has been absolutely amazing on the four episodes that we've released so far. So I just want to thank you for tuning in each week and sharing it with your friends and family, because the more people that you share it with, the more people that might come on the show. And... We want to release this show weekly, so we really need your help, listeners. So keep doing what you're doing, and if you can keep sharing it, keep telling people about it, we can hopefully get some some more listeners and get some more people on the show. Now, I also want to thank a couple of people who have left us some five-star reviews on iTunes. And the first one I'm going to read out goes, I found this podcast most entertaining. I really like the Australian content. It makes the podcast feel more like an experience from home and not somewhere else in the world. I will recommend this podcast to anyone who likes to hear about the paranormal experiences of others in an interview style format. The production quality is very good, which makes for an overall engaging experience. Now that review has come from Paul, who actually is the host of another amazing podcast, the Mysteries Abound podcast. Now, if you like stories that are are weird, unusual, perplexing, I recommend going over to iTunes and having a listen to Paul's podcast because it is absolutely amazing. If you're not listening to that show, I I really recommend going over there to check that out. And the other one I'm going to read out this week comes from Serene Elise on iTunes. Awesome job, Cade. I'm loving it. Thanks, Serene. I hope you do. And I hope you enjoy this episode. We're joined by Chris and Chris has got an absolutely amazing Yowie encounter. Let's get into it. I want to welcome Chris to the show. Chris, thanks for coming on. No worries at all, mate. Um, pleasure. We've got an old story that's, uh, that not too many people have heard. Yeah, and you said your encounter happened all the way back in the 1980s. Do you mind taking us back to, I guess, the first time you encountered what you're going to be telling us about? Yeah, mate. Um, I, I lived in a treehouse in the bush about four kilometres out of a little town called uh, Scott's Head back in the 80s. It was um, around about 86, I think. Might have been eighty five, but um, yeah, moved into a into a tree out in the bush, you know, as a as a kid, and um, I was a little bit uh, uh, you know, wary of the dark as it was at that, at that stage. And um, anyway, one night I, you know, I, I didn't have a kitchen. I had a campfire, and um, when it rained, you know, there was no campfire, so I, you know, I used to get invited um, into town quite a bit. The dinner and stuff, you know, and then I have to walk in after it. And um, yeah, the, the first night, the first night I walked home, um, I got about two kilometres out the road, and um, all of it, it was midwinter and it was it was quite cold. And all of a sudden, it sort of it, it, it got warm, and noticeably warm, you know, like that warm that you'd sort of stop and go, "Wow, it's really warm in this little." you know, little area. And um, so, yeah, it got warm and, and I noticed, noticed that. I was walking along a bit further and I um, I could hear, like, 
solid thuds in the bush, you know, like just maybe 10 metres. Like it's, it's old dirt, uh, sorry, old uh, country road where the bush comes pretty much right up to the road. You know, it's only two metres away from the road. Uh, and, you know, thick bush is like four metres away, five metres away. And this was in the bush, you know, and every time I took a step, it didn't take a step. And, um, yeah, as a, you know, I was freaking out. And my dog had a German Shepherd and she was, like, stressing uh, to the point where she ended up breaking the chain. It was, you know, about 500 metres in. She broke the chain and just ran off ahead of me. Like, <laughs> she'd never done that before. She was a really little dog. And um, she ended up going home. And um, so there I was on my own. And uh, this, you know, every time I took a step, this thing would take a step with me and I was freaking out. I lived in the bush all my life, um, you know, and I pretty much know what every animal sounds like. You can get some pretty big roos, but, you know, they've got tails, not two feet. And, you know, had about the same, sounded about the same weight as a, like a, a horse or a cat or, or a cow. Um, but once again, this thing had two feet and not four and it just kept following me and following me you know and, uh, I, I was freaking <laughs> I had my eyes closed by this point I was in the middle of the road and every time I'd look down every 10 seconds just to make sure that the white line was underneath my feet you know and just looking up at the gap between the trees making sure I was on the you know in the middle of the road and um just trying to get out of there and it kept following and following and it got to the point where I thought it sounded like it was getting closer and closer and, and it got to the point where I stopped and thought, right, I'll test this, you know, and so I'd take a step and it'd take a step and I'd yell out something and there'd be silence and I'd yell out again and there'd be silence and then um, then at one point I, uh, it, it sounded that close that I thought I was going to go for sure. I thought I was, you know, I thought I was dead. And um, I turned and just ran screaming at it, you know. And most animals sort of freak out a bit at that, and take a couple of steps backwards. This thing just stood its ground, didn't move, didn't make a sound, which scared me even more. And I was sort of like, by this stage, I ran into the bush, <laughs> thinking, come and get me, you know. And then um, with the reaction of silence that I got from it, it was kind of like enough to scare me even more. So I stopped and ran back out of the bush and tried to get out of there again and it just started following me again, you know. And this went on for about a kilometre. And uh, finally I um, I reached my destination, like, you know, I, I lived a kilometre to the to the right hand side of the road and this thing was following me from the left hand side of the road. And um by the time I reached where I get off the road to go to the treehouse, um, it it just stopped on the other side of the road. I thought for sure it was going to follow me in there, but it never did. And um, yeah, it, that was pretty much the first night, you know, um, that uh, this ended up going on for um, maybe two or three years. Every time I walked home. <laughs> So, um, oh wow! And how often? How often did you used to walk home? Was it a, almost a nightly thing? No, it wasn't a nightly thing. It was, you know, maybe maybe three to four nights a week. <laughs> so it was pretty reg- regular. But um, yeah, and it would follow you every time. Every night, yeah, yeah. It got to the point where the oh wow, yeah, the dog didn't even flinch. I didn't flinch. I sort of greeted it. I knew when to expect it. <laughs> um, you get the same. I used to think there was like a, it had a nest there just because of the warmth, you know. Um, maybe it lived there with, I, I, I don't know. But wait, as soon as the warmth come along, uh, then that's that's when it used to follow me around. And um, <laughs> but uh, where I lived, um, on the side that it was on, there's a market garden, like some. It, it used to be an old banana plantation. So there's acres and acres of bananas, and they just they just go ripe and fall off the vine, you know, off off the bunch, and like 
I used to live off the uh, the bananas up there, you know, half the time. I was a vegetarian at the time, and um, you know, I wasn't collecting uh, um, doll money, so you know, I wasn't working either. So I used to um, I used to sort of have to live off my wits a bit. And the banana plantation was a saviour. And um, there was also a market garden not far from there. Um, that uh, the, pers- the, the the old guy that owned the banana plantation in the like mid 1900s uh, was the grandfather of the guy that ended up um, acquiring the land and put a market garden up there too. So there was kind of like food everywhere, um, and the warmth come maybe 500 metres, 100 metres after the after the um, market garden, you know what I mean? So, um, I, I, I don't know, I think I think food situation and that's got a lot to do with it. Uh, plus, um, uh, being in the mid-80s, I didn't do any uh, research on it, um, computer-wise, because there were none, and I lived in a tree. <laughs> so, um, I asked around a bit, you know, like, people that had grown up in the area that were my age. I didn't really want to ask older people. They would have thought I was an idiot. Um, I already had a reputation as being that guy that lived in the tree in the bush out the road, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I didn't go too hard, but I, I asked a lot of friends and stuff, you know, like the ones who I thought were worth asking, the ones that lived around my area, and, and they all had sort of weird experiences that they couldn't really explained um and some of them had even had like experiences where they thought yeah it's definitely like a yeah and they'd um spoken to uh some elders around, aboriginal elders around the place and apparently there was a bit of a legend um and the um the cedar fellas from the turn of the 19th century you know like the first cellar guys used to go in there and um knock down a lot of trees and stuff and um Anyway, uh, they had a camp up there and they used to make their own home brew and that was apparently called Yo Happy Yowie Juice. So I've, I've looked that up online recently and I, I can't find any records of Yo Happy Yowie Juice. But anyway, that's that's a st- story I was told. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's um, that's pretty much the Yowie story. Never spotted this thing. Um, never had eye contact with it. But can't tell you for sure what it was. But, yeah, because uh, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. There is if you know if there was anything that kind of made this um, solidify that this was a uh, Yowie. Because did you have any? Um, did you ever go back and see if there was any footprints or maybe any markings or maybe hair caught on trees, anything like that? I looked out for a bit of hair and stuff. I never actually walked into the bush during the day. It never really even occurred to me, to be honest. I was only 15, you know, And um, but by that, by that stage I'd accepted it and I knew it wasn't, um, I knew it wasn't going to hurt me at all. Um, in fact, I used to tell my friends, you know, it's all right, I've got a friend walking me home. So, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I, I, I never felt threatened or anything by it. So, um, in fact, I probably would have been, you know, I, I ended up leaving the area first, but um, I, I probably would have been, you know, saddened by it not walking me home one night if, if, if that had happened. But, yeah, it certainly gave me a lot of confidence walking through the bush. I'm not scared of anything now. <laughs> um, you know, like, because um, it was huge. But, um, I mean... I don't know how big it was, but it weighed a lot. And, uh, yeah, it was a pretty crazy experience. And when I tell people about it, they sort of, you know, you can sort of see in their eyes, you know, whether or not you can, you can see them sort of laughing on the inside. But, yeah, it's sort of one of those things where um, there's no other explanation for it. it it's, I mean, from you go from legends, you know, and, and stuff, and then you try and weigh up, well, what's that big that lives in the bush? Um, and there just isn't anything in Australia that is that big that lives in the bush, you know. And, <laughs> um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, while I, I, I've, <laughs> I'm still sort of blown out by it. That's why I can still tell the story now. It's like 
30 years later, 40 years later, but um, it's still to tell the story the same way because, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to know exactly what it was. And, you know, I hear a lot of Yowie stories where I just go, no, that's not right. And, um, you know, uh, but, you know, something you're a and this, that and the other. And, and I just think, you know, <laughs> maybe that's, maybe it's just a crock, but, um, yeah, you don't hear many um, where they say uh, it, it wasn't aggressive, you know, or anything like that. This thing was not aggressive at all. In fact, it seemed curious and friendly, you know, sort of wanted to hang out with me. How did you go with it over the years? Did you find if it um, if it got any friendlier? Was there nights where it may have been a little bit off if it, if it was maybe frustrated or anything like that? You felt any aggression at all at any point? No, never, never. It was always just the same. Um, apart from my own fears on the first night, it was always the same. It was just like, yep, here he is. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd get to the um, yeah, I'd, I'd get to the get to the gate at, um, where I was going to walk off the side of the road, and he'd just stop there and you wouldn't even hear him walk back. He'd just, like stand there watching me. Okay, and <laughs> you say he never crossed the road because you said you live in you lived in a tree, which um, I think would be the the um the most ideal place for a fifteen year old, you know, I don't think uh, many fifteen year olds would say no to living in a tree house these days. So, no, that's it. Well, um, that was uh, the the place I was renting was just falling apart, and um, uh, one day I was having my first shave, and I got a knock at the door. I went to answer the door, and then as I opened the door, the the bathroom ceiling fell in. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, the place had to get condemned, and um, when it did, you know, there wasn't a lot of places available. And a friend of mine said, look, I've got a property out the road. Um, I've got a, you know, she had a, he, he had a friend living on the property, um, but they were down the other end of it. And it was about, you know, 10 acres or so. And it's really big. And um, I was up one end on the river um, in a, like a tree house. And, and they were in a house way down the other end of the property so um never really saw them at all and um my, my end was the bush end and their end was the like the homestead end so and it was only supposed to be um you know i was only supposed to be there two weeks three weeks or whatever until i found a place but it was that good living there that <laughs> i uh, ended up being there a couple of years I, I ended up getting kicked out by the council for living in an unregistered dwelling you know it was um that's that's how it happened. Otherwise, I'd probably still be there. You know, is that good? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, did you ever have? Um, could you ever hear the Yowie perhaps walking around underneath the the tree house or anything like that? Because it almost sounds like it would be quite familiar to you. I, I mean, considering that it, let's say, walked you home nearly every night for for a couple of years there, and. For it to show no signs of aggressiveness that first encounter, do you think this um, this Yowie was perhaps already quite regular with you? It may have been watching where you live and things like that. Um, no, I possibly, um, but I don't think so. Um, as for it coming up, like I'd be like going to sleep at night and. Out, out there, you could hear everything, and the slightest noise. Because I was on a creek, and I don't know if you know what swamp pheasants sound like, but they sort of go, woo, 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 you know, like that. And um, there's swamp pheasants all the way up every river. And if you drop a pin down here, the swamp pheasant at the front will go whoop whoop whoop, and then the one up there will go whoop whoop whoop, and it'll happen all the way up the river. You can hear it go for kilometres. So you, you can't really. You know what I mean? You, can, you can't even really sneak around up in the bush out there. Yeah, it's almost like your, your own little security system out there. Exactly, yeah. It's like the bush telegraph, you know. It's um, Yeah. So you know pretty much, you know, within two minutes, you'll know that something's happened two kilometres away. So it's it's quite funny. But, um, yeah, we had horses and um, actually we didn't have any cattle. We just had horse, horses on the property. And quite often they'd wander up underneath the treehouse and stuff and, you know, you'd be half asleep at night and you'd think, oh, hang on. And it'd be like, oh, no, that's a horse. You know, there's just different, 
you know, humans walk with two feet and horses walk with four, and there's just that difference. Yeah, and, yeah, and of course. Hit, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, sometimes you know they'd rub them so they'd scratch themselves on the um, on the tree, <laughs> and you'd feel that and hear it, and yeah, that used to freak me out a bit. Um, Mo pokes were a bit scary, but uh, one night I had a friend come out to my place, um, and I'd already had a thing organised with a mate, so uh, like a mate in town, so I had to leave him at my place and um, go away for a couple of hours. And when I come back, I just jokingly said, you know, like, <laughs> you didn't hear anything, you didn't get any visits or anything. And he's like, well, actually, were you here about an hour ago? And I'm like, well, no, I wasn't. And he's like, Some, I, had, I had like a, um, a ladder I made out of paper bark, small, smaller paper bark trees. It was pretty rough, but um, it did, did the job, you know, and it was like, because it was made out of the paper bark, it was kind of flexy. So as you're coming up the ladder, it'd bump, 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 you know, it'd bump against the um, floorboards of the treehouse. Um, he reckons someone or something um, come up the ladder, went down the ladder, come up the ladder, went down the ladder. But I don't know. I've got my doubts on that because in all my years of living there, it never, it never come on that side of the road. Yeah, right. And when you're yeah. living there, did you ever have any, I guess, suspicions of the Yawi being there? Is there any urban legends around the area? Is this, it just kind of showed up one day for you? Um, there are, there are the legends, but like, like I said, I, I never found out about them until after I had the experiences. I didn't bother, you know, it's just not back then. It wasn't the sort of thing you ask about. Um, but um, yeah, no, it just yeah, it just showed up and, and announced itself, and um, we went from there. And, and and all I could put it down to was the fact, you know, was a yowie. I mean, it's big. Uh, well, I, I didn't see it. Like I said, it's heavy. Um, it had to be big. But um, yeah, the strange thing was it was that heavy. But as it was walking through the bush, you know, it wouldn't break twigs or anything. It was just like silently moving through the bush but with the thuds so nothing was breaking underneath its feet it wasn't pushing trees out of the way um yeah it, it was a good mover in the bush and did you ever hear sounds from the yowie say it, there's calls or wood knocks those um the the howls that you sometimes hear that um yowies and bigfoots do did you ever hear anything like that on the on your property um i heard i've heard some weird noises but um, uh, I asked my grandfather. He's deceased now, of course. But um, my grandfather was a like a full full bushy, you know. And I could explain noises to him, and he'd go, oh, you know, it's it's just a possum, or it's just this, or it's just that, you know. And um, yeah, there was nothing much. There, there are a few shrieks, but um, there's also other properties around. It could have been someone carrying on like an idiot, having fun. You know what I mean? It, it, yeah, not really, no. In those big open areas, the sound can really travel as well, so it could be pretty hard to pinpoint where that's coming from. Yeah, yeah. You'd think out there it's really quiet, but you, I, like, I could hear um, I could hear the highway from, like the highway was about 20 k's away from where I was, and I could hear trucks going on the highway, uh, you know, motorbikes flying along the highway. Um, you could hear someone turning off the highway onto the Scotts Head Road and you could hear him basically drive the highway into Scotts Head. So, yeah, tra- the sound travelled pretty well there. Um, also, Yarra Hapney, the, the mountain range itself that I'm talking about, I don't think it's class. well, it wouldn't be classed as a mountain. I mean, it's just off the coast, but it's, um, it's if you look it up, it's um, Yarra Hapney, Peak, I think it is. It's behind Stewart's Point, around Scotts Head area, on the mid north coast of New South Wales. And um, you know, I'm pretty sure you know your Bigfoots and your Yowies and all that. They're all pretty much associated with uh, kind of mountainous country. And um, this was the highest peak in the area. And um, like, like the views are just magnificent. And um, it's kind of like hang gliding over the beach, you know, just being there. And, um, yeah, it's sort of, you know, so from what I've heard, it's the mountainous 
sort of areas that they they like. Um, uh, what else? Because the mountainous areas, the woody areas, there are valleys and little untouched ecosystems in there. That you know what I mean? It's um, people just c- could never get in there. It's the most. I think it's the most southerly rainforest in the southern hemisphere, or something. So yeah, it's pretty thick, and there'd be a lot of um, opportunities for bush tucker instead of the usual bland stuff that we usually get around Australia. You know, those kind of uh, wetter areas have it's got a few fruits and stuff around to eat. Yeah, absolutely. And with you saying there's um, banana farms around that area as well, I mean the I guess the, yeah. the resources are pretty bountiful for um, for anyone if they're kind of game enough to go onto the properties. So, have you ever gone back there, Chris? Uh, I haven't, unfortunately. Um, time sort of just um, defeated me, and I've had kids and stuff since then, you know. And um, yeah, life's just um, it's different. It's not as free as I used to be back then. You know, now I've got kids and work and stuff. I, just, I can't get a chance, mate. But, um, yeah, unfortunately. But I do know... Uh, oh, I was speaking to um, a friend of mine that knows the guy that owns the property. And apparently he um, he was on death's door a couple of years... Uh, well, at least 20 years back. So I don't know if it's all still there or not. But, yeah. Like, yeah, girlfriends I tell about it all want, you know, oh, got to go and see the tree house. It's like, geez, I don't know if it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be a long shot, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. So just before we wrap up there, Chris, um, when we were talking earlier, there was something that you said that really sparked my interest. And um, you said you've encountered uh, green floating orbs on that property as well. Do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, no, no worries at all. That was... Um yeah, it was quite mind blowing at the time. Um, well, at the time it wasn't. It was just freaky, and I ended up doing a runner on that one. But um, what happened was uh, over the years, I kind of got sick of my Yowie friend, you know, and, and I um, I got myself a motorbike <laughs> at one point, and um, it didn't have any headlights on it. <laughs> this is back in the day, so. You know road safety wasn't really enough, you know, <laughs> something that we cared about back then. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I had a, had a torch strapped to my, um, my handlebars, <laughs> which didn't work too good anyway. Um, I, I rode home one night on the bike and I got to the, to the turn off the gate there where, where my Yowie friend used to like leave me. And I um, turned the bike off and went to open the gate and just as I um, just as I was about to click open the gate, I looked up and I spotted these um, what I thought were fireflies across the road in the long grass. This wasn't in the bush; it had been cleared. I don't know for some reason there was no growth back there, and it was just long grass instead of um, instead of trees. And um, uh, and the long grass actually backed onto a hill. So uh, so anyway, I I saw this going on i saw two or three little specks of green light and i didn't know if australia had fireflies or not but anyway i was 15 16 and like, oh fireflies you know i was very attracted to things that glowed in the dark so i raced over there and um i went to went to grab one i didn't know what i was going to do with it but i just had to have it you know uh, so i went to grab one and it's um it started flashing aggressively like instead of like flash, 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 it's just started going flash, 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 and um, and then as it did that, it sort of flew up, and you know away from the reach, maybe got a foot up in the air, and then it started as it was flashing, it grew, so it sort of got flashed and got bigger and bigger and bigger until they got to around about two or three foot wide diameter um, flashes, which is pretty wide. Um, we're talking around a meter by you know a, a meter round, and um, bright green like bioluminescence type flashing. It wasn't a wasn't like a, a light or anything. It was just it was that nature bioluminescence style, 
And um, anyway, it had gone from one, oh, sorry, two or three, to about 33. Um, and all of them had started flashing. Like it, I'd only seen three at the first instance, two or three flashes here or there. It could have been the same one, just I wasn't sure. But anyway, when I went over there, I was just focusing on picking up one. And then um, as it went up and grew, all these others come out of the grass, like you know, 30 or 40, maybe more. As soon as they grew and started flashing at me like that, um, I just felt threatened and I ran across the road, opened up the fence, jumped on the bike <laughs> and floored it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, I don't blame you at all because um, that sounds so it's so unique i've never heard of anything like that the only thing that kind of comes to mind when i hear something like that is um you know maybe it might have been min min lights or or something like that yeah yeah i know what you're saying i have um a, you know i spoke to people who claim to have seen min min lights and they're apparently they don't have the green bioluminescence that these things have you know they're just like they're a, a blinding white light um, this was bioluminescence, you know, it was like when you're at the beach and you, you get the phosphorus and, and it goes green and yeah, it, it was that green color. Have you ever encountered that again? Or is that kind of a, a one-off type of moment for you there, Chris? That's a total one-off that one. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never again, unfortunately, because if it did happen again, I'd probably hang in there a bit longer to try and work out what the hell it was, you know? Yeah, and you don't have any ideas what that might have been. There's, there's been no talk of anyone else seeing anything like that around the, around the town. Nothing like that. No, no. Um, when I tell that story to people, I don't know if you know what I mean. If people are buying it or not. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't get a lot of, I don't get a lot of feedback from that one. The Yowie story, everyone loves that one. But um, yeah, the, the fairy lights, people, um, people just sort. Of, yeah, you go, oh, yeah, <laughs> and that's about it. But um, so I, I've never really asked about it. I've never I've never seen anything about it, you know what I mean? You know, when you hear, like, on your paranormal, you know, all that sort of stuff. I've, I've never heard this of, of this in any other um, in any other story. Yeah, either have I, um, which is why I, I'm so intrigued by it. And hopefully one of the listeners out there maybe has had something quite similar. And if they have, maybe they can share that story with us and maybe we can kind of piece something together. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. I mean, I, I, I put it, it, it's something, I don't know, it's some, I, I don't think it's anything out there. I think it's just, um, I don't know, it's just got that bio... But, that bioluminescence, which sort of is a giveaway that it's of this earth, you know, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that one. That, that was, um, that was out there. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't on any, any mushrooms or any, anything <laughs> like that when I saw that one. <laughs> yeah, that was, um, I just can't explain that one. And I, I just wish I'm really disappointed in myself that I, I ran from it. You know, I, I yeah. It's a bit of a primitive reaction, I think, where you just assume that everything's out to get you. But it was pretty aggressive, and um, they were in numbers, and I was outnumbered. So. Uh, look, Chris, <laughs> it, it's probably best that you, you did run away because if you if you don't know what it is, it could have been something that is maybe something that you didn't want to be messing with. Yeah, true. And like I said, there was definite, definite aggression in that one. That was, yeah, that was a bit out there. But with the big fella, he was he was fine. Uh, he 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 just followed me home every night, and like I said, in the end, I ended up, you know, ended up getting the bike and leaving him leaving him behind. It was <laughs> it was just it got old, you know. It, um, it happened that often. But um, yeah, the the lights that was sort of one of the only things that you know, apart from you know, I got a million shark stories I could tell you too, and that's probably up there with. You know, the fear factor is probably level with the sharp on that one. So, yeah. Well, Chris, <laughs> mate, I want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing those stories, um, especially the the one about the lights, because I that's really, really interesting. So I want to see if anyone out there has had something similar and see if we can put something together. Yeah, cool.
and it's been a pleasure telling it. I, I, I got a feeling that in uh, 15 minutes after I put the phone down, I'll, I'll remember some crucial little piece of something that I missed out on. But um, <laughs> that's that's it. How I remember it. It was a, it was a fair while ago, and um, yeah, I, I that's I, I put it down to, to the yowie, but I don't know. And that's going to do it for tonight. And remember, if you have had an encounter, get in touch with me. My email address is believe at ccradio.com.au or you can message me on Facebook and that's facebook.com forward slash believe UFO radio. Until next time, stay safe and you've been listening to Believe Australian Paranormal and UFO Radio.